But I feel like sleeping is the worst way. Ryan, you are mortal. One day you are going to die. Every hour beyond now is more precious than the last. I'll sleep when I'm dead. No. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we go back to our uh, philosophical route. Routes? Roots? Ro- roots. Routes. Roots. You don't roots. speak English today, do you? I don't. I don't. We've been working hard. We go back to our philosophical roots to talk about ethics. Actually, that's, you know, that's more apropos because we're going to be talking about the origin of our ethics, which is the roots of our ethics. So I thought that's where you were going with that whole sentence. No, I'm making this up as I oh go. Oh my god. So not only do we go back to the root of our training and how our relationship started, but we're also going to go back. It's like an inception of rooting. Stop talking. Icebreaker. Okay. Uh, what is an ethical position that you have rejected? Uh, so this one, when you posted it, it was, a, it was a weird and interesting one because I haven't quite rejected it outright. I've kind of consented to rejecting it, but there's still it has its claws in my mind. Mm. And that has to do with Understanding, okay, so no, the original position was that uh, philosophy is a dispassionate examination of ideas. Much in the same way, science is a dispassionate look at the world, right? That's the original position. And I realized For that. For those of you who are listening, I'm shaking my head right yeah, now. Yeah. And I realized that that works to a degree. But it does not work in certain specific examples, and recently with with the news and whatnot, um, with uh, philosophers who deal with racial identity and racial experience Mm -hmm. and uh, queer theory and specifically um, trans philosophy and trans philosophers. And I realize that that objective, we can talk about anything, is not exactly a good position to have. And I recognize that, and there's still some elements that I haven't quite been able to shake off for myself. Like, for example, the discussion of ideas as violence. Mm-hmm. It does. I don't quite like. I, I understand the general gist of it, especially because I understand that ideas lead to action, or that ideas are not in a vacuum when a person has been experiencing or has been marginalized their entire life and experiences oppression. I understand that, but I, I, I suppose you know, my disconnect is I understand it on an intellectual level, but not on a, on a lived level. Mm-hmm. And so that's where that tension is, is the original position of dispassionate philosophy is not a one-size-fit-all thing, um, but it still works its way into my thinking and causes some issues when, mm-hmm. I, when I'm trying to learn about things that are outside of my experience. Fair. Fair. That's yeah. There's there's a, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of unpacking that that goes on in there. With, mm-hmm. um, yeah, the notion that that um, ideas themselves. I mean, I mean, for example, like the the notion that we could dispassionately debate the legitimacy of a person's existence mm-hmm. um, or a person's right to exist. Um, you know, the 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 the, the, the dispassionate objective. Um, arguably fake version of philosophy that that is that says that's okay has problems. I mean, I mean, because there are there are things that shouldn't be up for debate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, be, in, in, because the mere act of having that debate or having that discussion uh, further further marginalizes people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the 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 classic of uh, explain explain to me why it's okay that you're that you're queer. Mm-hmm. Um, which uh, I'm not going to say is a discussion I've never had. <laughs> hmm. uh, you know, and it's just you're just like what, 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 like where does that even start? Like we've already made a bunch of a bunch of really shitty assumptions. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, an ethical position that I have rejected. Um, I had a couple, but uh, um, sort of dovetails with yours is the notion that. Um, it is necessary to understand something to accept it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I did a video on this, I think, last year. We'll throw in the show notes. But, I mean, the, the, the basics of it, again, like dovetailing with things like identity theory and, and, and queer theory, is that it is not necessary uh, when someone needs your support, someone is doing a difficult thing, it is not necessary for you to understand that thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it is necessary for you to, to accept that thing. 
um, I talked about it in the context of coming out mm -hmm. and the idea that that people are like oh well this is a this is a new identity and a new version of you and it's going to take me a while to understand it and they use that as a as a, as grounds for invalidating that identity mm -hmm. when in fact it is not new it is it, it the, the knowledge to them is simply new mm -hmm. and um you know it is it is what is necessary is not that they understand it um the people are perfectly happy to use airplanes and phones and cars without understanding them mm -hmm. um it is an unreasonable to expect that of people but it's also just generally sort of good critical thinking practice to accept as weird as it sounds, um, but like one of the classic moves in a discussion is to grant things for the sake of argument. Mm -hmm. So it seems it seems de like like equally easy to go. Okay, well, let's grant that everything that you have reported about you, literally your own identity that only you could know about is true, mm -hmm. given that you're the only authority on it. Mm -hmm. Now what? Mm -hmm. And the answer, you know, like, well, what are, well, are there, like, negative consequences, maybe, is a question that you might ask. And the answer is no, and also kind of who cares. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a position with, a room for, with room for a lot more nuance than I really mm -hmm. can get into in an icebreaker. Mm -hmm. But it is, one, it is one that I've left behind, that notion of, of understanding is necessary. Mm -hmm. The world contains in it more identities than I can fit in my head. Yeah. Um, but I can still ha hang out with those people. Yeah. Without giving them a fucking hard time. <laughs> so, yeah, the way that we wanted to do this was was dig into to not just the theoretical bits on on where I mean because we did we both we both wrote graduate papers and and graduate degrees in ethics mm -hmm. and. On very different portions of it, because you did rescue ethics, right? Yeah, ethics and first aid and helping yeah. people in, in emergencies. And I wrote on stakeholder ethics, hmm. um, and and the sort of the developing best best practices with regard to the moral imagination, and mm -hmm. a bunch of other weirdo things. So maybe we'll start at the beginning. Yeah. So early ethical influences like like where did you ryan the person mm -hmm. uh learn to do the right thing as a as a as, as a little tiny ryan uh, perhaps the tiniest of ryan's the tiniest, perhaps not you're the, quite large the tiniest that i've ever been mm -hmm. i guess um oh so i i have the um uncontrovertible or uncontroversial uh, origins of you know parents, grandparents, teachers, um, but I think the one that stands out more. The more I think about it, the more I realize that it did have an impact. Um, is and we've talked about it before. Uh, I think we've mentioned it before. Is Power Rangers? Yeah, we've almost we've almost certainly mentioned it before. Yeah, I mean Power Rangers, and I, I guess if you want to go something a little bit less goofy, although I don't think it's when I say that less goofy. I mean like Spider Man, for example, with mm -hmm. uh, with great power comes great responsibility. But I think Power Rangers articulated it a little bit differently, uh, but had the same kind of messaging behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that. I was conscious of this, or that I like wrote out Zordon's three laws of Power Rangers. Can you, for memorizing? reference, what are the three laws? Of so, because I don't remember. Yeah, so Zordon, when when the Rangers became Rangers in the first episode, and even in the movie, it was referenced. There were three canonical laws that Zordon, Zordon lays out for the Rangers. Uh, Zordon, 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 Zordon Lightfoot. Zordon Lightfoot. Um, first, you must keep your identity a secret. And of course, you, if you're like incredibly skeptical listening to this, you're gonna be like, obviously, these are things to keep the narrative going. Yes, totally. I understand that, but the idea, he says, uh, keep your personal identity or keep your identities a secret. So, okay, whatever. The second one's where things start to get more interesting. Never use your powers for personal gain. Mm. And I think that's that's in an extended sense, uh, like because that's not to say like you shouldn't use your talents to be able to profit from them. He's saying that you're you're getting these fantastic abilities. Don't use them to you know get yourself fame or glory. 
or any kind of personal motivation that way. It's mm-hmm. always it's always meant for a kind of greater good. Or your powers are used in proportionate to the good that they produce. And then the third one, and this one is perhaps one that actually has carried forward in time, is you never escalate a battle until, in this case, Rita escalates it. And of course, again, this is a storytelling thing because it makes sense why the Rangers didn't just drag out the Megazord at the first sign that there was a villain and curb stomp the hell out of it. Yeah, at the same time, though, like you have grown from a tiny little huckle mm-hmm. into a person who arguably professionally de-escalates things. Yeah, and that's why I say it's it's probably the one that's carried forward in time, and it's it's a thing that I value as a security guard that we exhaust any other alternative. You know, like the, formally speaking, it's called like uh, it's called the the use of force wheel uh, or the the influence wheel. Basically, you start off with you know really soft persuasion. And then you escalate it from there. You don't escalate it up until full force until it's absolutely required. Even then, sometimes it's not required that you use full force. You know, uh, mostly it should be more of a defensive thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you, the 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 stereotype of the bouncer that you know they tell you to do something, you don't comply, and so they throw a punch is something that's not accepted at our bar. And so that idea that. You know, you don't, you know, from a bullying point of view as a child, you know, you don't solve your problems by immediately resorting to force and violence. You Mm. find other ways of of doing it. It's, again, it's not something that, you know, like when I was bullied that I thought about. I was was actually a fairly um, easygoing temperament, so I was was bullied more often than, I should say, I remember being bullied more often than I consciously remember bullying people, which is not mm-hmm. to say I didn't bully people. Um, but when I when it was, I was more likely to be picked on because I was shy and introverted and, and whatnot. Um, but that idea that you don't escalate, you don't immediately jump to the last possible resort has kind of stuck with me over time. And then when I... I drifted away from Power Rangers and then I came back to Power Rangers as an adult and I and I re was acquainted with the three laws. I just was blown away <laughs> by how amazing and well crafted, perfect they were in terms of, of a good lesson. Like yeah, basically when I thought about this, I said if I had to pick a, a, a medium or if I had to pick a media thing to sit my child down in front of to learn lessons from, Power Rangers would probably be on that list. Fair? I don't know that that's how parenting works. That's I know um, that's not what Sarah's going to let me do. But but if I was a single parent, it would definitely be here's Power I, Rangers. I still don't think that's how parenting works. <laughs> but uh, I'm not an expert. Um, uh, I as a as a child did use force and violence to achieve all my ends. I had really I, I, I did not have a really well developed sense of like empathy or human relationships or anything like that. Um, I had a lot of behavior problems and. Um, ethical problems and I and I and I, I made a point of, of whenever adults would try and teach me a lesson I would learn the exact opposite lesson we talked about it in the pre-show where mm. I mean I, I was punished all the time as a kid um, you know by everybody from my parents to to schools to uh, every once in a while the police and uh, the lesson that I took away from that was learn to not fear punishment mm-hmm. Like, which, which is not the lesson that they were attempting to impart, mm-hmm. but is a learnable lesson from that. And once you are a child who does not fear punishment, um, the capacity for, not just for acting out, but the capacity for, like, damaging other human beings in your relationships with them mm-hmm. uh, grows dramatically um, in a way that I'm not particularly proud of. Mm-hmm. But uh, if, I, if I were to look for like sort of early influences on on um my ethics um i mean you 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 sort of like skipped over skipped over parents Mm -hmm. uh which i find really interesting um given given your 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 sort of like really close relationship with your family Mm -hmm. uh and the fact that like probably the center of my of, of my ethical universe at least as a child uh, was my mom. Uh, my mom is a woman of, like, towering moral character. <laughs> um, 
and especially when I was a kid, you know, there there was a, like like a constant emphasis on uh, practicing compassion, on recognizing like the 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 dignity of others, on being the same person in front of people that you are behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. And I remember, like, I remember sort of witnessing all of these lessons, but not, obviously not learning anything from them until much later. Mm-hmm. But in the, in the sense of, like, you know, we, we made a point of helping out neighbors mm-hmm. and being, being part of the community, whatever that, whatever that meant. Mm-hmm. You know, I spent a lot of time as a kid volunteering. I don't know how much of that was, like, actually teach your kid a lesson and whatnot. Lessons I wouldn't learn until much, much later in life. Yeah. But, uh, and how much of that is, is, is again, just, like, my mom being the person that she is. Mm -hmm. But it is in, 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 and it is interesting to see that reflected now, like, in my adult values. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think I have a lot of influences from, like, TV mm-hmm. and and books and media, like I probably do, but I nothing that I can really pin down. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't have a lot of friends, shockingly. Um, the exception being one kid, who also sort of had like a like a a strong sense of of ethics. And timing, because his my his mom was much like mine, mm-hmm. and we we got along famously. He was much more. I rem- I remember as a kid, he was mu- he like uh, he had a much better grasp of like other people. Um, like he was, m- he was much much more like socially adept than me, uh, and I and I spent a bunch of time. I I, I probably spent equal amounts of time. Like resenting him for that, but also like trying to learn, because mm-hmm. um, he was just generally much more pleasant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, so I mean, early ethical influences, like like the, I think that the, that it's really hard to get away from the foundation of your uh, of your morality. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, like I don't think it's it's a it's a big shocker to find that your your current ethical position like almost always like regardless of whether you're you're you know a full professor philosopher um or you know somebody who who hasn't thought about it until listening to this podcast i don't think it's that weird to find out that what you learned early on Mm -hmm pretty much agrees with what you think now mm-hmm. only now you have the advantage of, of like adding more nuance to it and understanding that like life life is complicated and it throws a lot of weird situations at you like power rangers doesn't deal a lot with complicated ethical dilemmas uh not that i can remember you know there there are a few like yeah. what do we do about tommy yeah and how come he's evil sometimes <laughs> but I mean, you know, or, or, or how do we deal with this responsibility? Mm-hmm. But those are, I mean, they're, 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 they're certainly not the same as, you know, dealing with ethical dilemmas regarding work or finances or mm-hmm. uh, personal relationships uh, or even just common action. Mm-hmm. Uh, because those characters don't experience those kinds of dilemmas. No. It is a kid's show. It's, yeah. We don't need to I mean, then, no, then, then it's, <laughs> I don't know. Avatar does it really well. I, I'm not entirely sure it was a kid's show, though. What, Avatar? Yeah. Oh, Avatar's totally a kid's show. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, and Avatar's all... Like, Avatar does it really well. I mean, admittedly, it has the advantage of being, th- what, almost 30 years later. Mm-hmm. 20 years later. So, you know, we've learned a lot about sort of writing and writing for TV and, and things like that. But Avatar does a whole bunch of, like... Here's a problem that actual kids have. Mm. Okay, well, here's them having a conversation about how to address this problem in a way that's useful, mm-hmm. um, rather than you know the standard 
we we deal with it indirectly and then learn a lesson and then close on a laugh. It, it it's really good at like, you know, let's have a let's let's take a, a situation that kids experience and show them like give them an example of how to have a hard conversation. Mm-hmm. And I found that really cool about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what's the current state of your morality? Yeah, what, what, do you, what do you what do you like like what's your ethical motivation now? Like how does that I mean obviously you're a filthy virtue ethicist. Yeah. As we've noted. Uh, we'll throw it in the in the in the show notes. Yep. Yep. Everything in the name of uh, my patron Aristotle. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. You get Um You've earned your due. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> um wow, I'm trying to remember where we were going with this in the pre show. I mean I, I know that my my sense of morality has shifted in the last say five years and I don't want to say it was exclusively you but I started hanging around or I started associating more closely with different kinds of people which no no I'll take to, credit yeah with different it exposed me to different things outside of my experience which um, shifted things around but um, yeah that's I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to draw a blank of how how uh, we wanted to proceed with this section of the podcast. So uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll take that line that line of questioning first. Then yeah. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time during my thesis thinking about intersubjective facts mm-hmm. and the idea that I mean, because we, we we spent a lot of time we spent a lot of time in general thinking of ethics as relative, um, and I don't. I don't know that I buy that it's relative. I buy that it's contextual. Mm-hmm. But I think that those are different things. Yeah. Like, we can we can have meaningful conversations about, um, you know, what we should do in any given situation mm-hmm. um, based on based on certain considerations. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, um, uh, he's a, he's a, he taught my business ethics course, Kurt. Um, and, and the magic phrase of, we should do X in virtue of Y. Mm-hmm. You know, like they're like like this is what this is the action we should take, and this is why we should take it. Mm-hmm. And those are those are things we can have meaningful conversations about. And if they were entirely relative or entirely subjective, mm-hmm. we couldn't have those meaningful conversations. Right, like they would end immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was weirdly enough. I think it was Ken Wilber. Um, I'll put a link. I'm sure that I can find something about Ken Wilber online. Um, but who, who, who introduced me to the concept of intersubjectivity and the idea that um, there are facts that don't exist independently of human beings, but that are nonetheless facts. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, sociological facts, a lot of sociological facts are, um, they are they're, they're intersubjective facts. Mm-hmm. So we can look at something like a crime rate, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. and we can we can see that the crime rate is has been progressively getting lower, mm-hmm. um, and that is a, that is a that's an empirical fact. Yeah, like based or like based on based on the criteria that we set out for what constitutes crime and et cetera, et cetera. Like there's a whole bunch of interestingly complicated um, parameters that go into that, but it's an, uh, but ultimately it's sort of an, a, a qualitative fact. Mm-hmm. But the fact that the crime rate going down is good is an intersubjective fact. It's a thing that we sort of, we understand mm-hmm. to be true, mm-hmm. but we didn't, we didn't like sit down and, and, and observe that in the world. Mm-hmm. We, we understand it to be true because it exists relation, relationally between all of us. It means, it means not, not just that people are less likely to be the victims of crimes, but it also tells us, for example, that people feel less motivated to commit crimes. Mm-hmm. And that gives us the opportunity to have additional conversations. Like, why is that? Mm-hmm. Are our draconian policing procedures finally working? Or um, have we adopted different societal models? Mm-hmm. And so we get into intersubjective facts of morality, and it, and it becomes pretty easy to recognize a bunch of, like, reasonably... I don't like to use the term universal things. I wrote about it in my thesis as as best practices mm-hmm. with the idea that I wanted it to be able to fit whatever motivational model you had. Like if you were a virtue ethicist, you can come up with best practices based on mm-hmm. your 
you know, your, the virtues that you embrace. If you're, if you're a consequentialist and what you care about is good outcomes, mm -hmm. you can develop best practices that create good outcomes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we can, we can compare practices mm -hmm. and have a conversation about those, mm -hmm. about which ones are better and why. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of what I wanted to get my hands on. So I spent a lot of time talking about stakeholders and who's a stakeholder in a decision and why. And I've got a bunch of posts on Concept Crucible about it. I'll throw the links in the show notes mm -hmm. rather than rehashing it all here. But, I mean, essentially anyone who's, who's in a position to be respected by a choice that you make or disrespected by a choice that you make is, is a stakeholder mm -hmm. and, and deserves consideration. And we can see that in all kinds of, of weird positions. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think about it in that way all the time. I think because I've internalized a lot of that. Because I spent so much time doing it. But, like, for somebody who, like, as somebody who, who spends a bunch of time sort of working on their empathy, and especially, like, like as somebody who grew up without a, without a really strong... Um, you know, sense of it, I find it really helpful to think about, think about ethics and, and action independent of the need for empathy. Mm -hmm. Like, regardless of, of how I am feeling or regardless of how I feel towards somebody, if they are a stakeholder... I understand that there are certain things that I that, that, that should be done, mm -hmm. and that like that is something that's really important to me because sometimes I'm not in the right headspace to make a good choice about that, mm -hmm. um, and I so I need that I need that strategy I need that plan to exist independent of my headspace. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like my my current ethics are are nuanced shockingly i spent a lot of time thinking about it <laughs> but at the same time they're 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 deeply geared toward the the like idiosyncrasies of being me every day mm -hmm. and i think that that's reasonably important for anybody is that i mean humanity is diverse mm -hmm. um and frameworks and situations are going to be diverse and it is weird to think that we could develop a set of rules that applies in all situations at all times. Mm -hmm. But it is reasonable to think that we could develop and talk about good sets of things that we do. I mean, I, I think that it is better to do good things for good reasons. Mm -hmm. But if we cannot do good things for good reasons, let us at least do good things. Mm -hmm. You inspired? Uh, I suppose, but mine's not going to be nearly as as wonderful and eloquent. Uh, oh God! Like I, I guess um, it kind of piggybacking on the idea that I'm now out of school and having to be my own person and whatnot. I suppose my sense of morality is influenced in a couple different ways. Um, recognizing and accepting that I am not an island, that I am a part of an interconnected community, whether mm -hmm. that is uh, my immediate community of where I live, uh, whether that's my town, whether that's my workplace community. And so I, I fit within it, and I'm not just <clears throat> a lone wolf. And I'm not saying that I was always that way, but it's kind of becoming more mindful of how the way I take up any kind of space interacts with other kinds of people. Mm. So personal senses of responsibility in that regard. That's it's the virtue of mindfulness. The virtue of mindfulness. Um, so, you know, uh, and, and the kind of old man huckle coming out when other people are less considerate, you know, the, the people who drive erratically on the road, you know, it's important to abide by <laughs> the traffic laws because it helps keep order and pr everybody predictable on the road. But um, you know, stewardship of my environment, both in the, in the kind of natural sense that I pick up dog crap, or I should say, I pick up my dog's crap. I don't go around and picking up other people's dog poop, but I realize that, you know, cleaning up after my dog so that other people can enjoy the space, uh, trying not to be too intrusive on, on other people's enjoyment of, of things, um, learning to 
that my ex- expressing my opinion is not always important, desirable, or needed. Mm. Uh, and keeping my most... I'm still trying to learn that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's probably because you're ever so slightly more uh, enlightened than I am. <laughs> But I find that I value my relationship with other people significantly more than than valuing needing to say something at a time. And a lot of times it comes to be true that perhaps I was wrong about it. And it's better that I not alienate people that I care about for the sake of trying to work out things outside of my headspace. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... You know, I might disagree with my friends. Uh, like, diametrically, I might disagree with my friends on, on a position. And whether or not the, I end up changing my mind or, or something else comes of it is not necessarily all that important. But preserving friendships and preserving those relationships are more important to me. Um, mm. So, yeah, I'm not really... It's not a really grand sweeping thing. It's just my... I guess... Uh, it just governs every action every day. I guess yeah. Okay, so it's it's, it's incredibly important. But uh, like I said, like when I started off this part of the conversation, you know, it really started to come in into its own in the last say five years. You know, since since coming out of grad school and having to deal with a a, di- a wider diversity of people, both online and in in meat space, that mm-hmm. um, contextual and case sensitive living is has become something that guides me more often and I care about things that I normally wouldn't care about or I let things go that I find is not important for me to follow up on and I know a lot of this is super super vague like when you when I go back and I'm going to listen to this especially when it comes to editing I'm going to be like yeah you were not talking about anything in particular were you but it's really hard to nail it down without going into specific case examples um I guess... Such is the problem of virtue ethics. I guess is virtue ethics and, and just kind of ethics in general that when you don't apply it to specific cases, it's just a nice wishy-washy rule. But <laughs> um, I would say, like, if, if I had to comment on my current current state of morality or the current state in which I, I try to live a good life, those are the kinds of things that are most pressing or most influencing of, of how I negotiate those kind of turbulent waters. Fair. Yeah, so in, you you meant and you mentioned uh, sort of you know having rela- like more diverse relationships mm-hmm. as being a, a a big cause in that sort of that sort of shift from you know being an island mm-hmm. and and being a, being a lone operator mm-hmm. to um, you know taking into account things like contextuality. Uh, different cases, different uh, like systems of oppression, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, intersectionality. I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll throw a link to the SEP page on intersectionality in, in, down below. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure that there is one. Mm-hmm. Uh, if not, I'll find a better resource. Mm-hmm. But uh, what are some other things that that you think have caused those shifts? I mean, the immediate ones in my life is very. I'm going to just say strong people in my life. The very people who care very passionately about these things. Again, the, because I care about them first rather than being right, um, I'm, and I guess this is perhaps a flaw of myself, but it's a flaw that I accept that um, because I care about them, I'm more likely to listen to them or I'm more likely to give them my attention mm-hmm. because I want to preserve that relationship. Um so, I mean, there is that element of it that, um, I guess, like, we've had AY on the show. Because I lis- I, I'm i friends with AY first, I'm more likely to keep my mouth shut and just listen and learn something from that. And I'm, I'm not going to say specifics of how things have shifted over time, but I can say that my my worldview has, has altered significantly from it, ha- it was, say, five years ago before I started. Because I interacted with AY first in... Was I in grad school and she was an undergrad? I think so. But regardless, like I'm a different person now, and I can say with confidence that I'm a different person in part because of how our relationship has has come about. Fair. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think of of other catalysts, like for for change. I mean, like for me, I I, I have definitely undergone some some pretty dramatic uh, ethical changes in the course of my life 
Um, some of that has to do with, with people and the people that I know and, and people that I'm influenced by. Uh, some of that has to do, I think, with, I mean, just perspective, like acquiring a wider perspective and acquiring distance from um, my brain just completely left my body. It's now uh, somewhere else entirely. But no, acquiring, acquiring distance from, from, in some ways, the person that I used to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, who who was a kid who who I don't know I don't remember I don't can't say with authority whether or not I was like I had bad motivations but I had a lot of behavior problems mm-hmm. um, and I've talked about that before uh, in the I think the character podcast but I think the one of the biggest ones for me is noticing gaps and this has definitely been true in the past. I want to say five, five to seven years where I will find a gap in my empathy, in my care, in my mindfulness, in uh, my ability to imagine what the, what the right thing actually is. And whenever, and I, and I think that that's not uncommon. I think that we, we encounter those kinds of gaps all the time. Mm-hmm. Whether it's an unfamiliar situation, um, whether it's an unfamiliar conversation, mm-hmm. and I think every time that we encounter those, we have to make a choice about about where we stand on that. Like, do we do we double down and say, okay, well, no, 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 no. I'm already doing all the right things, and I think that I have I have an advantage. And this will, this will maybe sound a little a little silly, but I, I think I have an advantage in that I have spent a bunch of time doing the wrong things, and I am I have certainly and I, I hope become more willing to entertain that like in that moment I am probably still doing the wrong thing, and it is worth considering the you know, other alternatives. It is worth it is worth like looking at that as a gap. Being like, if this is a gap, how do I how do I do it? I always I always talk about um, the constant studies of video games that, that show that video games don't actually like make you violent um, or or damage your empathy or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, they do. I mean, there's a bunch of like violent sensitivity stuff in media in general, but video games don't specifically contribute to that any more than television. And I find that really interesting. I mean, we have. I, I play a lot of video games. We have a lot of conversations about, you know, whether or not it is responsible to let children play video games. But the flip side of that, I think, is, and the, and the the bit that we don't talk about is that that means that I like I play a lot of video games, and when I find gaps in my empathy, they're not there because video games put them there. But they are still there, <laughs> and they need to be dealt with. And we're, we're, we find ourselves in this state, or at least I do, of, of imagining the person that we can be. The person that we want to be. Mm-hmm. And shuffling forward into that person's shoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we're going to talk about it a little bit, I believe, in, uh, in a different podcast about books. But, um, you know, in the last year I started reading more, and I think... Part of that was motivated by I wasn't happy where I was, um, you know, career, life, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> but I had imagined where I wanted to be or the kind of person that I wanted to be. And my reading was intentionally meant to try to bring me closer to that realization of the person that I wanted to be. Um, and I think sometimes that kind of introspective reflection can also uh, be an impetus towards you know, making a, a kind of moral or ethical change about yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, I read a lot of douchey self-help books, but I think in the last year I've also become a better person oh, yeah. through some combination. I always think of, I always think of, there's a line from um, Ms. Marvel, the new, the new Ms. Marvel, which is super good. And I've almost certainly quoted on the podcast before. Uh, I can't read that page without like tearing up where she's, 
sitting in her room. And she says, good isn't a thing you are. It's a thing you do. And, I mean, the thing with ethics is it can't just be ideas. It has to be action. It has to, it has to inform actual decisions in the world or it isn't worth shit. Mm-hmm. Um, which I guess is one of the things I like. I, I, like I really enjoy about it is that if you want something that... If you want something in philosophy that affects the real world, I mean, there's lots of different ways to get it. Mm-hmm. But there's no surer way than, than working in ethics. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. That, was, that, was, that got real. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you can find us on, if you want to talk about ethics or various quandaries or stump me with ethical dilemmas or a million other things, um, you can tweet us at Wootsuit, mm-hmm. find us on Facebook or Instagram at Wootsuit Riot. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to support the podcast, you can also do that. Um, and the podcast as well as our co-op adventures and our musical endeavors and all the other things that we do on our channel, uh, you can go to our Patreon. Mm-hmm. Uh, links are all down there in the show notes. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you very much. And let us know as well where, where your origins and ethics have come yeah. from. We yeah. We want to hear your stories. Always. Always. Oh. Anyway, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And we're signing off. Stay awesome. Now, just bef- sit back down for a second because this is a forced funny moment. Okay. Can you, can you say that Miss Marvel quote again? Good isn't a thing you are, it's a thing you do. Aristotle. Fuck you. you That's not true at all. <laughs>